Today on the Christian Nerds Unite podcast, I want to give you my review of Marvel's Eternals, now streaming on Disney Plus, and we'll get to all of that right after this. Looking for an effective way to connect with unbelievers and introduce them to Jesus? Contagious Disciple Making does just that. And their Philosophy and Strategy of Disciple Making Movement's live online class is starting very soon. To learn more, go to ContagiousDiscipleMaking.com slash class to pre-register. Learn about Discovery Bible Study, Disciple Making Movements, the importance of prayer, and building a community that seeks to make disciples from founder Paul Watson and personal coach Rebecca Ewing. Sign up today and let them know that Christian Nerds Unite sent you. And now, back to the show. Before we get into our review, I want to read some scripture that came to mind while I was working on this review. Let's start with Genesis 1, 1 1-5. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And Colossians 1, 15-20 The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. While working on the Eternals movie review, um, these scriptures came to mind because they're a stark contrast to some of the things we see in the film. Uh, In Genesis 1, we see God creating something that he says is good. And uh, if you read further, we find God creating man in his own image. And through the Bible, we see man created for God's pleasure to worship him. While in the Eternals, we see a God of sorts creating earth, or, or rather using earth, simply as a way to propagate his species. And uh, in Colossians, Jesus is shown as the Son of God and equal to God, and that he came to ransom the world by giving himself for it. In the Eternals, we see a group of people that are clearly a creation and are not equal with the God, and at first appear to be protectors, but are more like slaves to be uh, used, you know, a purpose they never understood. Well, we will get more into some of that as we get into the review, but I think it's clear we have a God that cares for us and wants to see us saved from our sinful lives. And I pray that you listening, take that to heart. God truly loves you. Even when things are rough, even when things are hard, Uh, You know, even when sometimes we don't feel it ourselves, God does truly love you. Now, let's get into our review of Marvel's Eternals. 
let me start out by giving you my no spoiler impressions first. Um, there will be spoilers later, and uh, so I'll give you a warning for that. Um, if you've not seen The Eternals yet, be aware it is available on streaming, so it's easy to watch. Uh, I'll let you know when we get to the spoiler part. So my first impressions, it was an okay movie. As far as Marvel films goes, this one is for sure in the bottom five for me. Um, maybe probably not the worst Marvel MCU movie. Uh, definitely far from the greatest. Uh, I think this film suffers from several major issues. First, it's the pacing. Uh, the first half is, is very slow. Um, since we don't know these characters, there's a lot of exposition, uh, an opening text crawl, some visual exposition, you know, showing everyone's powers and some kind of, kind of lengthy exposition to kind of build up a story. Um, second, there's, there's just too many new characters. <clears throat> it's hard to keep track of everyone and get any real character development from the majority of them. Uh, you know, also too many bad guys. Now I'll get more into that a little later. Uh, and a big problem I see is trying to tell too many stories. And once again, I'll get into that a little bit later as well. Uh, first off, this is not your usual Marvel movie. I will say that right up front. Uh, it takes itself up a little bit too serious. I think uh, it almost feels more like what I think a DC movie tries to be, um, or at least what they've been trying to be. Maybe somewhere in between DC and Marvel, but it just doesn't feel quite like the MCU we're used to. There are some glimmers of it, but then in other places, it just doesn't seem to jive. Uh, if you watch all the Marvel movies, this one will definitely stand out as different not necessarily in a good way. Overall, it was an okay movie. The story is mostly straightforward. Uh, some of the twists are a little predictable and others kind of subvert the narrative that they took a long time to build. Uh, and there are kind of a lot of stories they're trying to tell all at one time. Um, sometimes that works well. In this case, I don't think it did. Um, some of the acting came off a little wooden. Now, this could be a directorial choice. I'm not, I'm not really sure because these are some amazing actors. Definitely, there are some uh, actors that did a stellar job in The Eternals, and uh, they really stood out. While others that I would expect really amazing things from just didn't perform the way I would expect them. Uh, most of the CGI is good with a few exceptions here and there. Uh, maybe too much CGI in my opinion. Uh, I do like to see some practical effects and I, I almost feel like there weren't enough. Music is good. It's interesting. Lots of older pop and funk and jazz and a lot of the music lyrics are a little kind of on the nose for what's happening at the moment. It's a little weird, but uh, I get it. You know, if that's what you want, you know, then you do that. But a little on the nose for me. Uh, what you need to know as a, a believer watching this film. And uh, for those of you who are believers, this is probably the part you really want to hear first. Um, first, there is a creation myth kind of spelled out. That is obviously not a Christian one, uh, but if you're into superheroes or sci-fi, you probably are used to that kind of thing. So it's, this is not unusual in any way, shape, or form in this kind of media. Um, there is a sex scene early in the film that, in my opinion, is not needed. It, it, it doesn't stick out, but at the same time, it, it doesn't really have a firm reason to be there. Um, it doesn't add to the story in any way. Uh, there's no actual nudity. 
So be aware, if you're that's a concern. There's no actual nudity visible, um, but it's certainly implied that they are nude and that it's clear that they're engaging in sex. So be aware. Um, nothing you have not seen on most evening TV shows with steamy romances. So uh, you know. So that's a thing. There is a kiss between a gay couple from a secular view. It, it you know. It makes sense in the story wise and didn't feel forced, but it was not necessary in my opinion. Uh, mainstream network shows like Glee and Black Mirror and Will and Grace have shown similar kisses. Uh, it's not something I prefer in my media watching, but uh, in today's environment, it's not really surprising. Uh, but at the same time, as I said, from a secular standpoint, it, it didn't really feel like it stood out and it, it did kind of make sense in the story itself. Just not my preference. Um, there obviously is a lot of comic book superhero violence, uh, as always with these kinds of movies, uh, not much blood. So there's not a lot of gore, but early in the film, there is a scene where a father is basically eaten whole almost by one of the monsters while his son watches. And uh, that could be a bit traumatic for some people, so be aware of it. Uh, there is the usual smattering of curse words, but uh, no F-bombs. So nothing out of the ordinary for any other Marvel movie. Uh, but uh, actually, no F-bombs. Uh, there is also a strange, at times unsettling, requited love between Sprite and Icarus. Now, Sprite clearly has some form of love for Icarus, but this is not reciprocated in any way. Um, it's odd because Icarus is clearly an adult and Sprite is in the body of a young girl. Now, the actress at the time would have been 14 when this was shot, um, but uh, both characters in the movie are over 7,000 years old. Um, and we'll get to that part here in just a little bit too. So it's, but it's, it's just an odd choice and it doesn't really come off as a child looking up to a father kind of love. Maybe it's supposed to be more of a hero worship kind of love, but all in all, it just feels kind of, for a lack of a better term, a bit icky, <laughs> uh, if you think about it too much. So I try not to. Um, I would say this is not a movie for smaller children. Uh, it does earn its PG-13 rating. Uh, if you are familiar with the Eternals and the uh, Celestials from the comics, then you may see some similarities, but much of the backstory has changed, which is pretty normal for the MCU. Um, you know, they, they are constantly changing the backstories on all the characters and uh, blending them together and, you know, making things change. So none of that is surprising. Um, you know, there's a couple of gender swaps and things like that, which in these characters, since nobody's really familiar with them as far as the MCU goes, as the general public, uh, probably won't know them. It won't matter that much that some of that was changed. Uh, we are about to get into spoilers, so be aware. So we come into an opening crawl, which I'm not a fan of. If you've got to explain things to me on the screen, I'm not happy with it. I understand that's a Star Wars thing. It's been a Star Wars thing forever. Uh, but at the same time, if you're not Star Wars, don't do it. You know, just explain it to me somehow. Uh, but uh, it does kind of explain the MCU creation story, kind of. You know, the Celestials were before creation, and Arishem, who is the, the main Celestial and kind of the driver of this particular movie, created the first sun. Uh, it's explained that the Deviants show up from outer space and that you know, and for those of you who are listening you didn't see me do finger quotes there but we'll talk about that here in a minute too uh, so they show up somehow from outer space and the eternals are there to protect the human race from them which is mostly true well like i said we'll come back to that it's a full seven minutes before the opening credits roll and we get a quick intro 
during this time into each eternal and their powers. So, uh, you know, so let's go down the list of different characters. So we've got Circe. Circe is the main character that we're going to follow in this movie. Um, she has the ability to kind of transmute objects into other things. And later on in the film, you find out she can actually transmute living creatures, uh, which she didn't know she could do and later on has the ability to do in a massive way. Um, she is played by Jen, Gemma Chan, and she does a fantastic job as Circe. Uh, she is definitely the bright spot in this movie. Above all else, her acting is great. If you're not familiar with Gemma Chan, uh, she was in Crazy Rich Asians. She was actually also in Captain Marvel. You might not have known that, but she was in the Captain Marvel movie. Uh, but, uh, you know, her character was small enough that they felt like they could bring her back in a major role. And uh, this one, definitely, she is the lead character. So, next we have Icarus, who is kind of the Superman of the bunch, but not, not quite Superman. He's strong, but not the strongest. Has laser eyes and can fly, so you know, this gives him all the Superman kind of things. Uh, someone even calls him Superman in the movie. So apparently DC Comics is a thing in the MCU. Yeah, that's kind of funny and weird. Um, it played by Richard Madden. Uh, you might know him from Game of Thrones. Does a great job in this character. Uh, he is just a little stiff in his acting, but I feel like the overall story and the arc for this character, it kind of makes sense. Um, next we have Thena. Uh, she's able to manifest these golden weapons and shields from basically thin air. Uh, lots of CGI with Thena. Not necessarily the best choice. Sometimes it looks amazing. Other times, not quite. Um, played by Angelina Jolie, of all people. A great actor. Uh, Oscar winner for supporting actress in Girl Interrupted. Um, also played Maleficent. Um... In this particular movie, her acting, and this is where I don't know if this is Angelina Jolie or this is making choices or if this is the director asking her to do things. Uh, this character has some inner turmoil and some confusion and uh, you know some, some mental instability, it appears, in the film. And, uh, but the acting comes off very, very wooden and very stiff. Uh, the lines are del delivered kind of that way. Um, not the greatest betrayal. So I I'm not sure where, where that one lies. I, I think it, it does hinder the movie some, uh, in the way this is portrayed, but I don't know if this is an actor choice or if this is a director choice. Either way, I personally don't think this was the best um, the best uh, presentation that Angela Jean, uh, Angelina Jolie could have made in this movie. Um, definitely, uh, Gemma Chan way outshined her in this film. Uh, Ajak the power has the power to heal herself and others. Um, she's the leader of the team at first, and uh, she's played by Selma Hayek, um, an Oscar-nominated actress for Frida. And uh, she was also in House of Gucci recently. She's in The Hitman's Bodyguard. She's in Spy Kids 3, of all things. <laughs> okay. Um, great actress. And she really does a great job in this film. Um, Kingo. Kingo can shoot beams from his fingers and can create uh, exploding balls of energy. Uh, I'm probably going to butcher this name. He is played by Kamal Nanjani. And uh, who is a Pakistani actor and uh, actually apparently is going to be in the upcoming Obi-Wan show uh, on Disney+. Plus. I'm interested to see how that works out and what character he might be playing there. Um, Kingo is, a, is an interesting character. He definitely leads to a lot of the comic relief in the film uh, because he is a Bollywood actor. Uh, so, uh, that's kind of a, a shtick throughout the film. Then we have Sprite and, uh, we mentioned Sprite earlier. Sprite is, 
portrayed as a, a child, um, even though she is at least 7,000 years old, um, able to create illusions that appear real but have no substance. Uh, so, you know, if the creature swipes through one of her illusions, you know, the illusion is it's obviously fake. Um, played by Leah McHugh and uh, might have seen her in something called A House on the Bayou or in uh, the TV show American Woman. Then we have Fastos, able to create technology basically out of nothing, uh, played by Brian Henry. And uh, you may have heard his voice before in Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse as Jefferson Davis, Miles Morales' dad. So he's already had some experience in the MCU, kind of. Uh, not in the MCU, but in the Marvel Universe. And uh, also, you might have seen him on TV's Atlanta. Um, then we have Makari. Makari is basically a speedster, someone who is super fast. She's also the deaf character in the film. So we'd get some sign language throughout the film and uh, subtitles for those of us who don't read signed language. Um, Lauren Ridloff did a great job with this character. Honestly, I don't think we saw enough of this character. I would love to have seen more, uh, but, uh, you know, with the sheer volume of characters we have and uh, the the caliber of some of the actors, you know, somebody was going to not have, you know, great screen time. Makari definitely is one of those people who suffered. Then we have Druig, who is able to control people's minds. It's an interesting power. And uh, throughout the story, he has some some interesting takes on what should or shouldn't be done. Uh, played by Barry Cogan. Uh, great job. Uh, upcoming in The Batman, actually. Uh, he also was in The Green Knight. Then we have Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh is basically the strong man and has can generate these uh, magic gauntlets, for lack of a better term. And uh, played by Ma Dong Siok. And uh, supporting roles in The Neighbor and Nameless Gangster Rules of the Time and uh, The Unjust. So those things you might have seen him in if you've seen any of those. Uh, I think he does a great job with this character and uh, some great acting. It was uh, sad that he didn't get more screen time as well. Dane Whitman. And uh, Dane Whitman is just a regular guy in this movie. Now, later they do hint at his history. Um, we'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, played by Kit Harington. Um, might have seen him in Game of Thrones. Is probably what he's best known for recently. Um, this character should be the Black Knight and hold the Ebony Blade. And we get some hints at that later on. Uh, super underused character. I wish Kit Harington could have been in the film more. He's at the beginning and he's at the end and he kind of gets a cameo in the middle. And it's just I definitely shortchanged here, pr probably signed that contract because they said, uh, if you sign this contract, we're going to guarantee you're going to get a lot more screen time in something else later, but not this one today. So there we go. Uh, then we have a character who is definitely just there for comic relief. He's not a superhero. Uh, he is Karun, who is Kingo's valet. And they even make reference to him being, oh, a valet like Alfred in Batman. Uh, so another reference to DC Comics existing in the MCU. Uh, played by Harish Patel. Um, you might have seen him in BBC's show Coronation Street if you're into British television. Like I said, definitely the comic relief. Uh, he is actually uh, documenting everything that happens for Kingo. So Kingo can make a documentary. It is probably a highlight in the movie. Uh, he is a fun character. Uh, for the next 45 minutes or so, we flash back and forth from present to distant past, trying to give the exposition needed to set up the characters and the story. That's a lot of exposition. 
Uh, it makes for really, really slow pacing. So almost an hour into this movie, and we're just finally kind of getting to know everybody and getting to know the story. Uh, in this 45 minutes, we find out there's almost kind of a love triangle between Icarus and Circe and Dane. But since Dane is barely in the movie, you don't feel the love triangle, really. Uh, you know, where we are reintroducing each of the characters one more time. We, you know, we did it in the first seven minutes really fast. And now we're going to come back and we're going to do it again, give them a little more screen time. Uh, so go and reintroduce everybody. And uh, they find out the deviants have returned. And they basically get the band back together because everybody has split up. So we have to go travel and get the band back together. That's what the point of the movie is so far. So there's one story, get the band back together. Um, and then we find out that Ajak, who was the leader, is dead already. And no one knew it, kind of. Once again, we'll find out more later. Um, but about an hour into the movie, we find out that, oh, by the way, this story that you've just listened to over the last hour, that's actually not the real story. So now let's roll all that back and the Eternals are going to find out what the real truth is. So the Eternals are there to defeat the Deviants, but only so that the human race can reach the critical amount required to birth a celestial Tiamat from it, uh, that is growing inside the Earth and his birth will destroy the planet. So... They weren't lied to, meaning they were there to defeat the, the deviants, but they weren't told the truth about why they needed to defeat the, the deviants and why they needed to help keep the human race alive. And rather than being 7,000 years old, give or take, and being from the planet Olympia, the Eternals are actually millions of years old, and Earth is just one of many planets that they have already helped birth a celestial from. And this is no, and there is no planet Olympia. And uh, they've done this before thousands, maybe thousands of times, um, allowing planets to be destroyed. This time it's different. So um, they were made by Erishim, they find out. And in the world forge to help birth celestials. That's their whole purpose in life. Um, Erishim says that unless this continues, the universe will eventually die. We also find out that the deviants, as I said earlier, they showed up from outer space. Well, that's not actually true either. Um, Erishim actually sent them to Earth to remove all the predators that would limit human growth and development, but somehow he lost control of them and they started killing the, the humans. So we couldn't have that, so now we need the Eternals to get rid of all the Deviants. Now we get into the real story of the movie. That is the trolley problem. And if you're not familiar with the trolley problem, let me take a moment to explain. The trolley problem goes like this. There is a trolley coming at a high rate of speed down the tracks. There are five people working on the tracks. They cannot see the trolley, they cannot hear the trolley, and there is no way to warn them that the trolley is coming. You, however, are standing next to a switch. You can flip this switch and it will move the trolley onto another track. However, there is also one person on that track and they are also not going to be able to hear not going to be able to move out of the way and uh, you will not be able to warn them all you can do is choose to flip the switch or not flip the switch so the choice is do you allow five people to die by not flipping the switch or do you allow one person to die and save five by flipping the switch. This is the trolley problem. Uh, it's, a, it's an old philosophical 
thought experiment. It is something that has existed for a long, long time, uh, much longer than me. So which do you choose? And this is the crux of the film of the Eternals. Save the people on Earth, kill a celestial, or at least stop its birth. Mm -hmm. Or allow the celestial to be born and allow all the people on Earth to die. Which do you choose? And this splits the team and sets up the rest of the movie, which is kind of the actual real movie now. Um, at this point, we have the problem of the bad guys. Yeah, what do I mean by that? Um, I think this movie suffers from having too many bad guys. First, we have the deviants in general. You know, the deviants are the bad guys, right? You know, they show up, they're big monsters. Oh, kill the deviants. They're going to attack us. They're going to kill Earth people. We have to save people. Well, but then we have this one deviant that starts taking the powers from the other Eternals slowly. As he kills an Eternal, he takes their powers. Um, and he grows sentience. And uh, he, later in the movie, in the credits, he actually has a name. Uh, he's named Crow. He is the lead deviant. And he's actually played by Bill Skarsgård, uh, if you're familiar with him. Uh, he played Pennywise in the It remakes, as well as Zeitgeist from Deadpool 2. So he has actually been in the Marvel world as well, not in the MCU. Well, then we have another villain, kind of. We have Erishem. Is Erishem a villain? I don't, or is he a bad guy? I, I don't know if he's really a bad guy, but definitely the good guys are trying to do the opposite of what he wants. Well, then we find out that Icarus actually knew all about this because Ajak had told him. But Ajak had changed her mind and didn't want to let the humans die, but Icarus believed they should, so Icarus kills Ajak and is determined to allow the emergence, and Sprite joins him. So now these two Eternals are bad guys. So we've got a set of three different bad guys at three different levels. So now we have... Um, you know, multiple kinds of conflicts. So in storytelling, they say, uh, some people say there are four types of conflict. Uh, they say there's seven. Uh, I'm sure other options exist, but I I'm going to go with four at this point. And all four exist in this movie in the next 75 minutes or so. Uh, and that's a lot to take in. That's a lot of story. So we have, you know, what kind of conflicts am I talking about? Um, this is when we talk about man versus God, man versus man, man versus himself, you know, man versus nature. Those are the four that I think of. Um, and uh, that's the four that most people agree on. There, you know, like I said, there's some others that people add up. Uh, but, um, but most of the time, those are derivations of those four. So we have man versus God. So there's the, the heroes, some of the Eternals, against Erishem, going against his will. Then we have man versus man, the Eternals fighting with each other and with the Deviants. So there's even kind of two of the man versus man stories. Then we have man versus himself, which is the trolley problem. And Athena's inner turmoil, where she's dealing with her, you know, inner demons, which is actually her remembering that they've allowed planets to die before. Um, then we have man versus nature, kind of, with this emergence of Tiamat, uh, kind of the world destroying itself. So we have four different kinds of conflicts. We're going to all try to deal with all four of them in the next 75 minutes. Uh, and at the last moment, we even get kind of a deus ex machina moment to save the world. Uh, it's just a, it's just a little too much. Um, the stakes kind of sound high, uh, but since no Earth means no more MCU, we know the heroes are going to win somehow. 
Um, so they don't seem as high as they really could have been. Um, we do see another eternal die. So this does help raise the stakes some. Um, the action scenes are good. So that's a plus. Uh, the CGI, as I said earlier, is mostly good. Some full CGI stunts kind of lose gravity, which is a weird thing. Uh, it's not unusual when that happens, when they replace an actor with a full CGI character. It happens a lot of time where it, it just all of a sudden they kind of lose their weight. Um, luckily, most of these shots are you know zoomed out. They're not close-ups. But almost every time it was Thena. So, sorry, <laughs> Angelina Jolie. The acting is a little weird and you got some bad CGI. I'm sorry. Um, overall, it, it feels just like too much story to cram into one movie. And the slow buildup in the first hour, that's basically all a lie anyway, it feels like wasted time. We do get two interesting post-credit scenes. Uh, first, we get Star Fox and Pip showing up to some of the Eternals. Um, Pip in the comics is most closely associated with Adam Warlock, which is a little weird since uh, he's never really arrived in the MCU. He was hinted at before in the Guardians of the Galaxy. Um, Star Fox is probably the next best person for him to be with, though. Um, Star Fox being brother to Thanos is a thing in the comics, and um, it's kind of interesting that they chose Star Fox, uh, and he is considered an Eternal in the comics. I don't know if we'll call him an Eternal here, and in the comics, he's also been an Avenger. Now, his powers are a little weird to activate the pleasure centers of one's brain, which can lead to some not so savory possibilities. Um, I hope they avoid that and they just make him really charismatic and you know, people fall in love with him. I hope they kind of make him the Adam Warlock replacement. Uh, my best guess is that this could allow the Eternals to meet up with Thor and the Guardians of the Galaxy since they have some odd connections there. Uh, that's my best guess. I, I hope that's where they're going. So second, we see Dane once again. So this is Dane's back in the movie again at the very end, the very last moment. Um, I really hoped he would become the Black Knight in the movie, but he didn't. Uh, but he, we do see him reveal the ebony blade. And uh, the blade is even referenced earlier in the film. So this film has an Easter egg to itself. That's kind of fun. Uh, so expect to see the Black Knight in the future. Not exactly sure when, but uh, the next voice we hear does give us an idea. Uh, it is confirmed that the voice is that of Mahershala Ali, who will be playing Blade in the MCU. So it sounds like these two are going to be working together soon. Um, it's not really been a comic book thing, although they do have a, a strange connection with a spy organization um, in the comics, but they haven't really worked together as much as, as far as I know. Um, but it's not clear why they decided to go this way with the MCU, but it's an interesting take. Maybe we will see Kit uh, show up as Dane or as the Black Knight in the Blade movies. Could be interesting. Well, final thoughts. Like I said earlier, it is an okay movie. Uh, for sure, not the worst MCU movie, but uh, for me, probably in the bottom five. Um, there are some bright spots, but I think they're, they simply overshadow all of the overall density of the film. Uh, how can a movie be too slow and too dense at the same time? I'm not sure, but I feel like Marvel's Eternals did it. Did just that. Um, should you see it? If you are an MCU fanatic, you will want to just to keep up with where these characters are and who they are and in so that when they show up in other places, you'll recognize them and you'll understand where they're coming from. If you're concerned about the sexual issues I mentioned early on, then it's probably not for you. 
but this is secular media and it is tame compared to things like Game of Thrones. So parents be aware and if you're concerned with them, uh, at the very least, watch this with your children and have discussions about these issues and about your personal beliefs about them. Um, like I said, I can't tell you whether you should or shouldn't, um, but those are kind of the things you need to know before watching The Eternals. Well, that's all I have for you today. Don't forget to like, subscribe, follow, click, just click click all those buttons down below. Uh, that way uh, you can keep up with us and every time we release new content. Uh, you can also find all of our social links and links to our YouTube channel and to our online store at ChristianNerdsUnite.com. And while you're there, click on the support tab. We would love to have you as a Patreon. Before you go, I do want to leave you with this blessing. John 14, 27, the words of Jesus. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. We'll see you next week. Blessings.